Oh, hello. Hello, Charlie. Hello, everyone. Um, I am just so excited to have this uh, conversation uh, this afternoon, this evening, um, with Nancy McLean and Charlie Cray. Um, I'm here, Lisa Graves, on behalf of Bold Rethink. Uh, I'm with True North Research, and we wanted to meet today on this Monday, August 23rd, 2021, because it marks the 50th anniversary of the issuance of the memo that is uh, the infamous memo called the Powell Memo. And um, we're going to talk about what the Powell Memo is, who Powell was, um, how we got into this mess, uh, how we might be able to get out of it. And I have two um, uh, guests with me here uh, whom I adore. Uh, one of them is Nancy McLean, who is an award-winning scholar of 21st century history. Uh, her book, Democracy in Chains, uh, The Deep History of the Radical Rights, self Plan for America. If you haven't read it, read it, get it, uh, share it. Um, it's still August. You can still read it from the beach if you want. Um, and I have uh, Charlie Cray, who's a senior research specialist at Greenpeace, and he specializes in corporations and democracy. And Nancy does also, obviously, as a uh, the William H. Tapey Professor of History um, uh, at uh, Duke University. And so we have two really renowned experts on um, right-wing history in America and the impact of that um, on our democracy, on our country, on our freedoms. And um, so I'm going to just jump right in and um, uh, ask ask them a couple questions. This this dialogue today, we're going to just focus on substance. We're not going to have the short the short version at the end so that we can really maximize the substance and um, information that uh, that uh, you can learn from these two wonderful, amazing, brilliant uh, writers and researchers and thinkers. So um, I wonder, Nancy and Charlie, if uh, you could uh, share with folks when you first learned about the Powell Memo um, and also what you think are some of its most harmful effects. Uh, Nancy, do you mind going first? Is that all right? Yeah, I think I first uh, read about the Powell Memorandum in the 1980s um, and was intrigued by it, was shocked by it, you know, heard mentions of it over the years, but I really didn't realize how pernicious and far-reaching the impact of the Powell Memorandum was until the last decade. And really the scale and the determination of the corporate mobilization that the Powell Memorandum uh, and other events at the time, particularly the Powell Memorandum, helped set off has I mean, there's no other way to say it. It's become a kind of a mortal threat to civilization um, when you think that the planet is at stake, the health of our planet, that our democracy has been rendered inoperable by corporate interests and the way disinformation have be has become so pervasive. So we'll talk a lot about more particular impacts, but really I would just emphasize that the scale and the determination of the corporate mobilization that we have seen as a result of the Powell Memorandum and all that followed is something that every American needs to understand. Wow, thank you, Nancy. What are your thoughts, Charlie? Well, um, I think the time I came to the Powell Memo was really from stepping back from immediate campaigns on incinerators and toxic chemicals and trying to mm -hmm. understand why we were getting nowhere proactively on policies. And it obviously had to do with something about corporate power in Washington, D.C. At the time, I was living in Chicago. Um, and, you know, so I went to a conference and I heard um, Ralph Nader and Robert Weissman talk about the topic and raise the issue of the memo. I'd never heard about the memo, so I, I hunted it down. And um, I think it's instructive in terms of the history and understanding trajectory of sort of the scaffolding of power in its many dimensions that corporations wield over all three branches of government. That's, that's the importance of the memo. It was a call to arms um, by, if you, if you don't mind, I'll mention it. I don't know yeah. if people know, but Justice Lewis Powell at the time um, was an advisor to the U.S. Chamber and one of the members of the chamber's board went to him and asked him to write this memo. He was at the time a board member also of Philip Morris. He was a lawyer who had previously been the president of the American Bar Association, uh, very important and eminent person. And, and only a few months after he wrote this memo, he was nominated by Richard Nixon to be a 
uh, member of the U.S. Supreme Court, and went on from there, as Lisa knows very well, to be the lead um, author of many important decisions that expanded corporate doctrines, corporate rights, and we'll get into that, I think. Um, but I, you know, it was for me many years of study on the side to understand this, um, the importance of this, because we often don't take time out from very reactive campaigns to think about blue sky ideas. What do we want? How are our values translated into policies? And, you know, um, and we often just are in such a reactive rut that um, that it, it almost becomes impossible to stir up our own imaginations. And part of that is because we haven't had any way to implement it. I mean, many people have writ written about the memo point out that we haven't had major environmental legislation since the early 70s. There was a whole slew of them. And then now, I think since 1990, the Clean Air Act amendments were the last major round. Um, but the Powell memo kind of was a reaction to a whole slew of uh, laws, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, pipeline safety, you know, Ralph Nader's groups, the Raiders, they were, they were effectively freaking the industries out and running the table on the hill because they were organizing people. Um, and um, this was one of the reactions to it. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, I really appreciate your uh, sharing some of that history with folks. Charlie, I, um, I uh, really appreciate Nancy's point about the impact as well, um, the impact then and now in terms of, you know, whether the, the democratic will of the people in the United States can be moved forward in our national legislature, um, in part because of the distortion of these um, special interests, these very special interests. And um, I'm gonna come back to you in a second, Charlie, but I wanna go back to Nancy for a moment. Um, you know, this, this question of, um, you know, we have these founding documents that we know about, we have the Declaration of Independence, we have the Constitution, we have the amendments, and then we have this memo, which, you know, isn't an amendment to the Constitution, but has had a profound impact on how our Constitution is interpreted um, and, how, um, and how much capacity we have for our laws um, in Congress to do the, the people's will. Um, and I know that you looked into these matters within your book and your other writings, Nancy. I wonder if you could share with folks a, a couple of the impacts that you see um, from the Powell Memo from this effort to exert uh, corporate power on public policy for the last 50 years. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, what Charlie was saying was so important, too, about the influence that the people were having on government, you know, in the mid 60s and into the 1970s. There was really a quite um, a progressive turn in public uh, opinion, you know, partly encouraged by the civil rights movement and the women's movement, the questioning of U.S. foreign policy. And that really put corporations in the spotlight. And they were not winning these battles, you know, in public opinion for the public mind. So that's really the context for the Powell Memorandum, I think, that we have to understand is that there was this surge of popular power. And as Charlie said, you know, in addition to all the environmental legislation, women were making gains, you know, people who uh, were impoverished, who were receiving public assistance, were making headway in the war in court. There was just so much going on uh, that was so positive and so exciting. And it terrified right-wing corporate leaders, um, you know, who felt like they were losing control of the show. So that's really the context in which the Powell Memorandum came up. And as I was listening to Charlie, I was thinking about that old um, saying that there's ultimately really two sources of power, organized people and organized money. And so what Charlie was describing is the extent of organized popular power uh, in that period that led to all those legislative milestones. And what, what the Powell Memorandum did is really help to begin organizing the money to say to corporations uh, that you have got to get into the game politically if you want to you know, keep your interests at the forefront. He encouraged mobilization to change the courts. He encouraged mobilization to monitor and change the media. He encouraged mobilization to change higher education. And on all these fronts, since the Powell Memorandum, 
we have seen tremendous change. So the extent of corporate uh, influence over the political process, and I think we'll talk about that in more specific terms as we move along, but that has been huge. The courts have come to the point where even a sitting U.S. Senator, um, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, has spoken of captured courts. You know, it has a very informative captured courts project. Um, so we also see the Coke network is kind of the most radical, determined um, uh, effort to operationalize some of the ideas in the Powell Memorandum. And they, you know, now there is literally an anti-democratic corporate funded infrastructure in this country of hundreds of organizations, right, from, that weren't there before. You know, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Federalist Society, the state policy network, which you've written so brilliantly about, Lisa, and exposing, you know, the way that this brings together some 150 state groups to shape policies in the states. Then we also have mobilization outfits to drive this corporate agenda, such as the Americans for Americans for Prosperity, Generation Opportunity, they call it, um, the Libre Initiative. So there are just so many ways in which the Powell Memorandum kind of catalyzed so much of what we're seeing now uh, to the point that you can really think of democracy as being in a kind of chokehold. And unless we can release the grasp of that corporate power, we're going to be in deep trouble. Yeah. You know, you we didn't coordinate this, but um, but I do have Sheldon Whitehouse's <laughs> book here captured, which also I do uh, I do strongly recommend yes. uh, for folks to take a look at and also Senator Whitehouse's speeches uh, this summer. Um, and and his his remarks uh, on the nomination at uh, the nomination hearings about Amy Coney Barrett about the, how the court has captured and I was fortunate to um, testify before his subcommittee this spring about some of these uh, these issues about how um, this memorandum that was written uh, and issued 50 years ago today called for businesses to get more involved in submitting so-called friend of court briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, to sort of alter the interpretation, not sort of, to actually alter the interpretation of our constitution and of our statutes and the power of the federal government to do the will of uh, we, the people. Um, as Charlie mentioned, you know, one of the things that struck me when I was going back through some of the history is um, how it felt like, uh, and I think it was real, that in the 1960s, um, our US constitution uh, started to finally be living up to some of the promises in the Constitution. Actually, I think the you know the beginning point uh, of that uh, bellwether period was Brown versus Board of Education, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know uh, Powell has had a role had a role before he was um, on the Supreme Court in um, the issue of how that law how that interpretation of the Constitution about equal protection of the laws and that we could not have racially uh, segregated schools how that was going to be implemented in Virginia. And I know Nancy has looked into that uh, as well. We can definitely touch on that uh, in this conversation. But it, but it really, in my uh, view or my estimation, what we saw from 1954, you know, up to 1971, was a real burst of uh, public, um, you know, of, of the public calling for our constitution to mean what it says, for there to be the voting rights that were promised in the civil rights the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, for those civil rights to be honored in law. It took statutes to secure the voting rights of people. Um, as Charlie pointed out, Ralph Nader was working hard to um, to, to respond to the operations were basically calculating um, the number of lives they were willing to risk uh, who could die if their uh, products weren't um, safe rather than recall those products that, you know, there was not a sufficient profit in recalls. And so um, there were companies uh, like the, you know, uh, products like the Corvair uh, that was in Ralph, in Ralph Nader's words, unsafe at any speed, demonstrably so. Um, and uh, there were citizens and consumers groups fighting back. There was a, a tremendous, um, horrific spill is the wrong word, a total disaster off the coast of Santa Barbara. Uh, that drenched uh, the shores of California in oil, and um, there was a great, a great uh, sort of uh, 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 push forward of of people across the country saying we've got to protect our environment. That that led to the first Earth Day, 
um, the tobacco companies that uh, that Lewis Powell was defending, um, that those companies, uh, uh, they were um, required to suddenly put labels on their cigarettes, telling people that they were dangerous or you know could be harmful to their health. Uh, that was an industry that he was defending that had mm -hmm. um, that had been telling people in commercials on the Ed Sullivan show and other programs that not only was smoking not bad for you, it was actually good for you. Um, you know, so uh, there was a great awakening, I think, in America. And the, the Congress was really responding uh, in many in many respects to the to the desires of the American people to protect air and water, to have safety rules, uh, to make sure that our voting rights were really protected and not um, not trampled on by the Klan and by you know uh, white supremacist organizations, um, you know, and uh, and and Powell, in my view, um, found those efforts to be um, anathema to his worldview. He thought of them as an attack on. I know I'm talking too long, but I'll get back to you, Charlie. You know, an attack on what he called the free enterprise system. That there, that there was, um, you know, socialism and communism behind every, uh, every door, every every measure that they opposed, and that, that there was, um, the schools were infiltrated in essence by socialists and socialism, and that the universities weren't teaching about corporate corporations, uh, a view toward deference to corporate power, and he even asserted that no one had less influence in American society in 1971 than the American businessmen which was false back then. Um, but then he laid out a plan to make that never be the case um, or to really, um, as Nancy pointed out, put forward these institutions, entities that would advance that corporate agenda. So um, that was a bit of a long interlude on my part, I apologize. But I wonder, uh, Charlie, um, you know, 10 years ago, you wrote an analysis of the 40, on the 40th anniversary of the Powell Memo for Greenpeace. And I wonder if you could share some of the findings from that work or uh, updated findings you may have. Sure, um, thanks. Um, so if you look at the Powell memo and it's it's kind of a strategy memo and I think you've alluded to some of this before, but he sets out certain realms of uh, important parts of civil society and government that businesses should focus on and really take over. Um, I mean, it's no exaggeration to say there's a certain call to arms here in this memo um, really to call the war. Um, and uh, those include the campus, which Nancy knows a lot about, um, and groups like Uncoke My Campus have, have really brought a lot of attention to the media. Um, they felt like they were not given equal, uh, you know, say. Um, I think Powell himself, um, defending the tobacco industry, thought that they were on the short end of the stick when it came to the fairness doctrine um, had had really pressured uh, media to give the tobacco industry their ability to say that there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about um, you know health links to cancer uh, cancer and other impacts of smoking and he had so he had a, a background in understanding the importance of speech doctrine uh, both commercial and political speech which I think is a really uh, really critical part of this. Um, uh, conversation. And then, uh, of course, the courts. He did say in the memo that the courts may be the most important. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's his perspective coming from where he does. But also, um, I think from what we've seen since, including the expansion of corporate speech, and we know all the way through Citizens United that it's in the political realm really expanded. I mean, every, you know, in 1975, there was a um, a Sun Pack, the obscure decision called Sun Pack, which allowed corporate PACs to uh, solicit contributions from employees and manage those contributions to give out on their behalf. Um, and it's expanded everywhere since then. I mean, you know, when you think about it, after Watergate, after Nixon, uh, you know, we had the, that's the last time we've had any major campaign finance reforms and regulations. Um, we had a little bit with McCain Feingold, but really, Ever since then, Powell and the court um, have really expanded the rights of corporations to throw money around under the guise of being um, contributors to public speech, um, which is really kind of laughable. And it's predicated on the notion that they are kind of, you know, shoehorned into the role or standing, as lawyers put it, of uh, average people um, who should have their own voice. 
Um, so I think that that was why they set up all these legal foundations, you know, uh, for that for that reason to develop strategic litigation. Stephen Teals talks about this in his book on the rise of the conservative legal movement. Um, you know, they in the 70s, there was and all the way through now, um, they've been challenging the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act. Um, they set up the Pacific Legal Foundation and others all around the country in different regions. And then they started realizing that they needed to coordinate more. So after about a decade, they started consolidating their strategies. They did um, judicial junkets where they brought active practicing lawyers and scholars together with um, judges and, and clerks to discuss uh, doctrines that they should uh, uptake and learn about and frame their reasoning around. And, um, you know, it goes from there, just in the judicial realm, as Lisa has, has and, and I think it's important that you, you pulled out Senator Whitehouse's book because he gets it. And yet it's a history that we've forgotten. Uh, you know, the progressive movement kind of pulls itself um, together around Supreme Court nominations generally, but we really, in between those, we really need to get more organized and focused and and uh, active uh, because we've lost a lot of ground since uh, those days, just in that realm. And we could talk about the media, uh, we, you know, the whole demonization of the media as the liberal media didn't start with Rush Limbaugh. There was accuracy in media, Reed Irvine, and they actually, I think, um, preceded some of those things. So, so, um, so this is a marker of a large history, you know, the Powell memo, it, 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 a lot of things preceded, but it's, there's, it's very rare that you see a strategy memo of this type that pulls a lot of things together for the business community into one, um, voice and one kind of, you know, multi-dimensional um, game plan. Yeah, and I would actually pull back on that too and say, you know, as the uh, as a historian in, in this conversation, that this actually goes farther back too. You know, like you know, we've all been talking about what was going on in the '60s and the '70s and the Warren Court, and you know that, that the Brown versus Board of Education was an important launch point for this. But actually, Powell and the the person who invited him to produce the Powell Memorandum, Eugene Sidnor um, of the Chamber of Commerce, who was Powell's neighbor in Richmond they really wanted to push back on the New Deal. They were determined to do that. And so actually, Sidnor was part of creating something called the Virginia Co uh, Commission on Constitutional Government during massive resistance. And the idea was to go back to an interpretation of the Constitution that predated the New Deal um, mm -hmm. and what's called the Constitutional Revolution of 1937, which is the basis for the entire federal regulatory state. So I think we also, I think one of the things like Charlie was saying, you know, movement, activists, journalists, you know, legal strategists have to have a chance to do blue sky thinking and look at a big, deep picture. And I think when we do that, we also see how the um, growth of federal power and particularly federal regulatory power in the New Deal actually undergirded all the progressive victories of later years. You know, the labor movement in the first instance, but then the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the lesbian and gay movement, the environmental movement, all of these built on that interpretation of the Commerce Clause that enabled uh, um, uh, regulation, including regulation against discrimination and for the environment. And so one of the things that we see with Powell, I mean, he actually urged that Roosevelt be defeated in 1940 for the good of the, said for the welfare of the country. So he was quite deeply, you know, allied with, with the right um, and nervous about this new regulatory state that would challenge corporations. And I think that that's important to our understanding of what's happening and to kind of taking our bearings because for a long time, the progressive forces have operated kind of in silos and intellectual silos and practical silos. And when you look at something like Powell and the roots that he came out of in Virginia, what you really begin to see is that 
the way that they're opposing progressive victories and the things they're taking aim at are actually what unite us all. <laughs> you know, that we all need a federal government that has the capacity to regulate for the common good, that, that can act on discrimination or environmental danger or, you know, workplace risks like COVID. You know, there's all these things, these mechanisms that we depend on and the very idea of a government that's responsive to the people. And that's really what Powell and his Virginia allies were taking aim at, you know, well before he issued the Powell Memorandum or got on the court. Wow, Nancy, you know, that really uh, jarred my memory about, um, you know, there was a great article in the Washington Post in um, 2019 in May. There are many great articles in the Post, but this one I remember um, in detail because it was about Leonard Leo and about a speech that he gave to the Council on National Policy in which he basically said that due to the appointments that Trump had made the U.S. Supreme Court that America stood, I'm going to paraphrase here, America stood at the precipice of the revival of what he called the structural constitution um, to the era before the New Deal. So really this, this same theme uh, that was being put forward by uh, Sidner, the recipient of the Powell Memo, uh, urged by Lewis Powell himself uh, through time to be this, uh, this hostility to the New Deal this, these are deep roots that this reactionary right-wing movement has been fighting for so long. And you link, you think about our history um, in this country, what you had for, um, you know, the first century of American history was a Supreme Court that was not willing to um, protect individual rights, the rights of human beings uh, that chose to begin to elevate corporate rights, the rights of railroads uh, over the rights of citizens. Um, you had uh, uh, in the industrial revolution in full, um, you know, uh, full bore with people challenging uh, the conditions of work that they were, that children uh, were forced to work in terribly unsafe conditions, that there weren't days off or time off, that there weren't protections for workers. And the courts were striking down that social justice legislation at the state level, you know, and the federal level through what was known as the Lochner era because of a, a case called Lochner versus New York that attempted to assert um, economic power, basically, or economic freedom of contract as the dominant right uh, in our constitution. And it took the, the depression, our country falling into that global uh, horrifying depression that uh, Roosevelt's policies, President, President FDR's policies um, really um, broke America out of. And those policies included, you know, basic protections for people like having social security, which some of these uh, groups that were spawned by the Powell Memo, uh, including some of the groups that Charles Koch have spawned, have, you know, uh, continuing hostility, the idea of social security, the idea of public labor education. rights. Yeah, public education, the idea of public schools. And so it is a long fight. And the Powell Memo represents, you know, one moment in that long, that long fight. But I think so many people who are progressive or mainstream moderates don't realize that this fight has been going on, that there's been this tremendous organizing on the right to take away, to claw back mm -hmm. um, our uh, system of government to the pre-New Deal days, the days, the era of the robber barons. Yeah, and I think Lisa also on that, you know, um, Lewis Powell has gotten a free pass, I think, from many liberals and journalists because he voted, you know, he, he was on the side of uh, the Roe v. Wade decision and because he cast a deciding vote in the Bakke case to uphold affirmative action, but he actually upheld it in a way that undercut our ability to deal with structural uh, discrimination, including the kind of structural discrimination he inflicted as a member of the Richmond and school board, but but even there, you know, because the court has become so right wing now, you know, and had such vitriolic justices like Antonin Scalia, uh, Powell got kind of a pass on things. But actually, you know, Charlie mentioned this before, but we would not have that devastating Citizens United decision had it not been for the jurisprudence of Lewis Powell. So Lewis Powell actually laid the groundwork quite deliberately um, for what became Citizens United with a case called um, uh, Na First National Bank versus Bilotti. It's often called Bilotti. But he actually, with that, began a radically new jurisprudence that gave for-profit corporations 
First Amendment protections akin to news outlets and to membership-based nonprofits like the NAACP, which had been under attack, you know, by massive resistors in the South. But what's really um, significant here is to understand how radical what he was doing was. So even a, a vigorous conservative like uh, Justice William Rehnquist um, criticized Powell's faulty reading of precedent in the Bologna case um, because Powell refused to acknowledge that for the entire span of American history until that point, corporations, or I, I shouldn't say for the entire span, from, from the 14th Amendment forward um, after Reconstruction, uh, soon after Reconstruction, corporations were recognized as kind of artificial persons in law so that they had liberty rights, property rights, but they didn't have free speech rights because everybody knew they were artificial creations. They weren't people. But what Powell did was literally misread precedent, right, on the basis of a faulty reading of precedent, suddenly grant these radically new rights to corporations and create a kind of trail in precedent that enabled Citizens United. So what's important there is today, you know, and I, I teach U.S. history, when people talk about the Lochner Court, you know, that prevailed until, um, until uh, the, the New Deal in 1937, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's like the battle goblins of the old days, you know, like nobody can imagine going back there. But Powell's position was to the right of the Lochner Court because yeah. the Lochner Court didn't give corporations free speech rights. And that free speech First Amendment jurisprudence has been the entering wedge of so much that corporations are doing now, including claiming a religious right to discriminate. Like that wasn't there before, you know, before they started using these First Amendment rights. So I just wanted to underscore that despite his reputation as a moderate, when you get to these questions of corporate power, pa Powell was quite a radical. And it's also, I think, worth pointing out that he was the only corporate attorney on the court. So everyone else that he was working with had different kinds of backgrounds. And so he really, at least according to his biographer, really kind of, you know, um, bullied his way into um, uh, authority on those cases and kind of, you know, pushed aside other justices saying, you know, look, I have practiced corporate law. I know these things. You don't. And it got to the point where, where uh, one legal scholar has called him the corporation's justice because mm -hmm. he did so much to transform corporate law in so many different uh, domains. So, yeah, it's, it's really, I think, important for people to use this 50 year anniversary to reflect on on what Powell brought. Wow, Nancy, Charlie, you were you were uh, jumping yeah, in. I just to wanted to uh, mention two resources. One is Jeff Clements wrote this great book, Corporations Are Not People, um, that goes through the history of this. Um, and the other is um, Free Speech for People and Greenpeace published a report called Contaminating the Courts. And what we look at is, you know, most of the time we think about corporate speech, we think about political speech, the ability to spend money and lobby and so forth. But uh, commercial speech is where and through which companies often challenge new regulations and say that they are a violation of their rights of speech. And Powell was around when some of the seminal cases were um, addressed and established some of these doctrine, like the Central Hudson case, which allowed a utility to refuse to allow inserts in bills to the uh, ratepayers that would give them tips on how to be, you know, have more efficient electric, reduce their bills by having more efficient appliances and so forth. Um, and then we've seen, you know, corporations sometimes successfully challenge truth and labeling laws or other ways that they say, well, that's compelled speech and we should be allowed to be silent as much as we should be allowed to talk. Um, and that's been, um, you know, an ever um, expanding realm for them. I mean, they haven't always won. You know, we do have public health um, exemptions. We don't allow tobacco companies to, thank God, uh, uh, advertise on television, you know, anymore. Um, but you there are things you want to do and you really it's a struggle um and a lot of that is because they have that threat or they take to court um you know and then they have an even higher valence level of threat which is the whole realm of uh, 
you know, free trade where you have these unaccountable transnational um, arbitration processes um, that can intervene or put a chill on new regulation. So, you know, um, they've sort of built up this incredible systemic challenge to public interest minded uh, policymaking. And, um, you know, it, 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 it affects us all so deeply all the way down to, I think, psychological uh, and other ways. You know, it's trite to say, I think it's cliche to say we're now, um, we think like consumers instead of citizens, um, but it's true. It's, it's our very creativity is often um, guided by uh, a lot of that. And um, I think we need to, you know, pull back and, and just entertain some of the incredibly interesting creative ideas that people have about commoning or reclaiming public services. And if you do that, you start to see, wait, this is why, for instance, in the current infrastructure bill, AT&T and these other companies, they are basically rigging the game so you can't build community cooperative broadband, right? They're basically saying, no, not going to happen. Or uh, look at COVID. Um, you know, one of the things the chamber did, um, you know, has done since the Powell memo, they built that Institute for Legal Reform, the Chamber Litigation Center, and they've been a pile driver for tort reform, which is basically a way of, you know, blocking people's entrance to courts to get justice. Um, and um, you see this with um, an attempt to get exemptions for um, long care uh, assistance facilities, right? That's in the news now about how they carved out exemptions from liability. Um, I think that started in New York. So, um, you know, these, these um, things that seeds that, uh, that Powell and, and companies around him that, that took his word and went out and built these institutional and uh, political and litigation strategies, they live today. They are, every, if you look, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but if every time, if, if you look at the docket for the Supreme Court, you know, they talk about this being a litigious society and, you know, they demonize trial lawyers. Well, who's really bringing all these cases? Okay. Look at the dockets. Yeah. Of these kids, yeah. you know, it's not it's like we're, we're saturated with corporate lawyers in this country uh, dreaming up all these new ways of rigging the game. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, I think there, too, uh, Charlie, maybe one of the things that we might mention, since it was the Chamber of Commerce that solicited the Powell Memorandum and the Chamber of Commerce that has mobilized like no other, you know, kind of corporate body um, in the years since, that the Chamber itself is structured to protect corporations from accountability. So they give money to the Chamber, but then their brand is protected from people knowing that that was actually mm -hmm. coming from fossil fuel companies or to tobacco companies or other kinds of dirty interests, you know, who are, you know, the nursing home companies are incredibly good point. patients because they didn't follow proper procedures. So I think people need to understand that too, that it's a form of, you know, kind of bundling money and then the corp the chamber can take the heat, but it's not going to hurt anybody's brand. Um, yeah. And they've been tremendously successful in that one, one direct outcome of the Powell memorandum was the launching of the U.S. Chamber litigation. Uh, center that I think Charlie mentioned that began in 1977 with the mantra of fighting for business in the courts. And people need to know in the Roberts courts, this Robert, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court under, under uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, the, the Chambers um, Litigation Center wins seven in 10 of the many cases it brings. So like Charlie says, you know, most of these are corporations cases in the courts, but they're winning seven to 10 in the Roberts Court. And, and that is what um, Senator Whitehouse was getting at too in this notion of captured courts where you have a conservative majority that all comes from the Federalist Society. You know, they've all been groomed to have a certain ideology so that you can pick one or another and get kind of the results that you would like, which is a similar thing to what the, the um, right, the Koch-led right has done in higher education since the Powell Memorandum with funding centers, funding particular faculty, funding uh, research programs, funding, you know, um, 
programs for undergraduates so that they can recruit them into this highly political pro-corporate pipeline. So it, it really is a pretty breathtaking operation in its scale once you understand how the different pieces are not really as separate as they look, but they are actually integrated, work together, share personnel, resources, coordinate activities, et cetera. Yeah, I, you know, I have so many thoughts in response to these fascinating insights that you have, you both have brought. I, I'll, I'll just share a few and then we jump back to you, Charlie, if that's okay. You know, um, you know, one is just that uh, the idea of commercial speech mm -hmm. would just be anathema to the founding fathers, not that the founding fathers uh, got everything right. They certainly got some, a couple of things very, very wrong, but you know, there weren't corporations that had endless life. Uh, in our country at the beginning of our nation. Corporations were limited charter entities for the organization of capital. Um, and now they have become basically in some ways like zombies that live forever, um, that uh, can do harm and very rarely um, you know, disappear due to the harms that they may cause. And this idea of quote, commercial speech, even calling it speech, versus you know the desires of corporations that to be free of regulation to be to not have regulation be part of the conditions of them being able to accumulate so much capital you know it's an extraordinary doctrine uh as you point out nancy that lewis powell uh in engrafted onto our first amendment and it damages are grievous quite mm -hmm. frankly you have a situation where a company named you know hobby lobby uh, you know, could somehow assert that it had a religious belief when it's not even a human being. Uh, it's not a person that has a human right, the, the way our First Amendment might be conceived of as, as a protection for human rights, uh, freedom of conscience, the, the ability of human beings to petition our government for redress, the ability of human beings to report on uh, the news of our country, free, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But this idea that a corporation like Hobby Lobby could assert that it had a religious belief that would allow it to forbid women to have access to IUDs, to intrauterine devices that, um, you know, allow them to prevent pregnancy um, under their religious grounds. And, you know, there's no uh, religious reference to IUDs in the Bible. I've read it cover to cover, not there, uh, you know, but there is a, a reference in the Bible to um, thou shalt not steal. And uh, subsequent to um, this decision by the Supreme Court giving um, religious rights to Hobby Lobby to bar its employees from having access to um, mainstream medical treatment, uh, Hobby Lobby was you know, charged with um, stealing you know, hundreds and hundreds of artifacts from the Middle East. Um, so there was actually a, a religious uh, doctrine that they could look to if they, if they were of, a, you know, of that nature. Um, but that one commandment against stealing did not apply, but they could freely under this Supreme Court apply an alternative view of their religion to deprive women, you know, access to those, um, that medical treatment under the, the Affordable Care Act, under Obamacare. Sorry to dive in, dive in there, but it's just so um, interesting and awful to me, this idea that a corporation would have rights that are superior to the rights of those employees, those human beings. And we, we've seen that in the last 10 years where under the Citizens United decision, which is certainly also on that direct line in a way from, um, from Powell, Powell's memo, um, the, the, the US Supreme Court was awarding rights to corporations, uh, nonprofit and for-profit corporations. And this has happened at a time in which actual human beings' rights to, to free speech, to dissent, have been crushed by some of these corporations like in the Dakota Access Pipeline cases and more where corporate power uh, is used to basically repress people's ability to engage in dissent, but corporate speech is held, you know, to be one of the highest um, values. And so, you know, it really is upside down to have a situation where ordinary human beings' rights, you know, in our democracy, uh, to, the right to vote, the freedom to vote, uh, the right to have our voices heard in our democracy can be drowned out by the spending of these artificial entities, nonprofit or for profit, um, without the regulations that would allow people to see who's spending that money, to see which CEOs um, are operating behind the scenes to exert extraordinary distorting influence um, on our democracies. So, you know, I just think, you know, the memo is um, obviously one snapshot in time, but it did spawn uh, so many um, actions and, and activities that have really distorted our policy. And I'll, I'll just end on this and pass it back to you, Charlie. You know, one of the groups that came out of the Powell memo was the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, uh, 
uh, which is a group where corporate lobbyists vote as equals with legislators on bills, they call them model bills, before those bills are introduced in state houses. Those bills have included um, you know, measures to basically block local broadband, to block local communities from being able to have um, local, you know, high speed internet um, when corporations will not, you know, spend the money to provide that. And also we saw one of Alex Torp bills, Charlie, that you mentioned the agenda to make it harder for people to go into court. One of Alex Torp bills, which is a bar on um, uh, pain, damages for pain and suffering in Wisconsin after the Alec legislature took dominance in our state here where I am in 2011, um, one of the first things, the very first thing they passed was a measure to um, make it harder to hold nursing homes accountable so that a nursing home resident who was injured could only get um, actual damages or could only get pain and suffering damages that were uh, in proportion to their quote actual damages. But nursing home um, residents don't have income. You know, they're not, they don't have lost income. They're in by definition in a, in a nursing home. Um, and they are being in a care environment where um, if they're injured, they could have tremendous pain and suffering that isn't related at all to their, you know, out of pocket damages. And I thought that was one of the most immoral um, pieces of legislation I've ever seen. The idea that a corporation's rights would, would um, overcome the rights of a family to hold that corporation responsible if their loved one was killed or injured at a nursing home, uh, it's extraordinary. And then we saw Alec in this pandemic pushing for um, freedom of li from liability for corporations who, um, who injure their employees or their customers by not having protections uh, against COVID. And so you just have this dominance of corporate power, corporate wishes over the interests of ordinary people that is just extraordinary. Um, but Charlie, I think you were gonna mention something about uh, one of the issues that Chamber uh, has been involved in. I don't wanna, I know we're, we're running up to the edge of the clock, but um, yeah. I wanna give you a chance um, to that, and also Nancy to get back to you. Yeah, the, uh, Nancy mentioned that the Chamber is basically a trade association. It represents uh, most of the Fortune 500 companies. They claim to represent all business. They don't, the American Sustainable Business Council, many other progressive and uh, mostly smaller companies differ very much with the Chamber on a whole range of policies. But, you know, currently the Chamber is uh, one of the, you know, we looked up who's lobbying to kill the For the People Act, the most important uh, pro-democracy bill um, on the table, you know, uh, the companion bill to the John Lewis uh, bill. This is the bill that would put the hinge back on democracy's door. We need it to get to the other, uh, you know, reforms. And the chamber has invested more than any other entity in Washington, D.C. to kill this bill. Um, they are, um, they put a, an alert to the members of Congress and said that we're going to watch you closely how you vote and we're going to grade you based on that and our PAC contributions will be distributed accordingly. And, um, you know, they're, they use incredibly facetious arguments. I won't go into it, but basically their motive is because the bill would eliminate dark money and require them to disclose who's giving them money, uh, i.e. how much are each company's giving them for political contributions and so forth. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention because, you know, that they have a direct stake in blocking the most important democracy bill that we've seen since the civil rights era, really. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out, um, was on this question of corporate speech. We have to look at the sort of the gears of corporate governance too. You know, these entities are creations of law. You know, we talk about corporate charters and people say, well, they're the investors, they create them. No. We create them through government, right? We allow them to exist. They used to have to get their charters renewed by state legislatures every 10 years. We've become a colonized nation now in our thinking because we think, well, that's, you know, they're the ones who create themselves and so forth. But it's important to understand why, why that's important is because charters are the way we put structural boundaries on the purpose of corporations or can we we really have these laws of general incorporation now after 200 years of uh race to the bottom and in fact um we described this and uh, put a plug personally for the people's business this book we wrote one of the chapters we talk about a lawyer who went to virginia powell state and incorporated uh a company called license to kill 
whose very purpose was to distribute tobacco products around the world in order to kill 400,000 people a year. And they, they rubber stamped that and said, yeah, you're good to go. You know, um, that's how weak the oversight of incorporation in our current legal system is. Um, and um, the final thing is on, on this question of corporate speech, again, the governance. Think about the rights of corporations to speak versus the rights of all those stakeholders they claim that they care about within the corporate community. What are the rights of employees to speak up and form unions? What about the rights of shareholders who own the companies to say what kind of policies that company has or how they should spend the profits instead of buying shares back? Um, what about distributing that money at, at least or using it for long per long term sustainability purposes and investments? Um, very few times does even the board have any say over corporations. Um, and this has been going on for decades, way back to Burley and Means when they talked about the separation of ownership and control of companies. And people have tried to penetrate that corporate veil and in ways that challenge that. Um, most recently in Exxon's case, one of the owners of the hedge fund challenged their uh, board uh, nominations and, and was successful to, and we'll see if that leads to changes in the company's, uh, you know, destructive climate policies. Well, I, that's uh, super important. And Charlie, I have not read that book. So will you show it one more time so I can no. see it? I gotta put it on my list. I have, and I highly recommend it. It's really- it's Called The People's Business. Excellent. Controlling Excellent. corporations and re we said restoring democracy. We should say expanding it. I don't know if we ever had it fully, but. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so before we come into the final set of questions, I wanted to um, ask you, Nancy, a little bit if you could share about um, uh, a little bit about Rupert Murdoch and sort of how he may play in this story about uh, Powell and the media. And also um, uh, a little bit if you could share a bit about uh, uh, the impact on on higher ed and and, and uh, on cam on campus um, mm -hmm. uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, that we um, have um, uh, promoted a document on on Coke Docs, one of the sites that I have worked on with Connor Gibson, who was previously a researcher over at uh, Greenpeace, and uh, that document was um, about Charles Koch two years, uh, almost three years, I guess, after the Powell memo, saying it didn't go far enough. Yeah. because not enough strings were being attached to funding for universities. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to pass that baton over to you, Nancy, and then we're going to come back to you both about um, what you would urge people to do, things that they might do or, or how they can help. So yeah. the floor is yours, Nancy. Yeah, I mean, I would say on the question of media, it is just so incredibly important that we understand how we reached the point that we've arrived at today, where, you know, look at the COVID situation, right? That, 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 that here we are in the wealthiest country in the world, we have the capacity to vaccinate everyone, but instead only about half of adults are vaccinated. Why is that? That is because, uh, you know, and I'm not going to say this is you know, totally on Lewis Powell, right? It's all these people like Charles Koch, you know, and other, you know, grassroots people who came after them. But but what they did that was so important and that is a result of the Powell Memorandum is create an alternative media universe. And Powell really criticized the media and said that corporations weren't being treated fairly. They weren't getting their voice. And again, remember what Charlie was saying, you know, this is at a time like the Vietnam War exposed Dow chemicals and Agent Orange you know, the environmental movement was showing what fossil fuel and, and other, you know, uh, corporations were doing in terms of putting toxins in the environment. So, you know, the uh, Ralph Nader and the, the auto companies that weren't having seatbelts or, you know, uh, caring for people's health, tobacco companies. So there was a bottom line, what I'm getting at is there was a lot of legitimate reason for the media to be giving bad coverage to corporations. But instead yeah. of recognizing that and saying, hey, we better clean up our own house and stop doing these things that are so terrible for the public. No, Lewis Powell said that the media was a threat to free enterprise. And so that really began a series of, you know, um, uh, events and actions that led to the right pushing very hard for the end of the fairness doctrine in media, as we've talked about before. And the end of that fairness 
doctrine uh, was what enabled the creation of this right wing media ecosystem, which is so insulated with Fox News, you know, as the most obvious um, uh, elephant in the room, but also other elements of it. But what we've seen with Fox and and uh, communication scholars have done a very good job on this. Fox News does not exist really to provide information, right? In fact, much of the information that it puts out is wrong, inaccurate, misleading, attacking, et cetera. What they do so well is to cultivate an embattled white nationalist identity and to play to white evangelical voters who are anxious over the future of the con country and to constantly consolidate this embattled identity and then to provoke it. So I saw something recently, for example, saying that Fox News had mentioned critical race theory, had run these, you know, crazy inflamed stories like 1900 in a two week period, you know. And so that's the kind of thing Fox News does. And what that's meant for the rest of the country is that at least a third of Americans are not in the factual universe <laughs> with the rest of us, right? And so we cannot have, you know, meaningful, you know, empirically based public conversations about how to address our health, how to address the threats to the climate, how to deal with structural racism, you know, how to deal with, with the care crisis. All of these different things are obstructed by that right wing alternative ecosystem uh, of media. So we have got to get at that. But as you mentioned also, Lisa, the other part of this was creating a kind of alternative corporate funded right wing world in higher education. So the Powell Memorandum was crucial in having uh, corporate right wing investors like um, uh, like um, John Olin, who funded many positions in law school, Charles Koch. You know, we could go into some of the other names, but those are some of the key ones. They have funded, uh, as I think I said this before, and I don't want to repeat, but they have funded centers, they fund faculty, they fund students, they fund research, and then they use those bases in universities, which essentially they're buying. A friend of mine calls it coin-operated scholarship. They use those bases in universities when they come under attack for things that they've done wrong, right? So, <laughs> if say you know uh, Exxon Mobil or Coke Industries is reported in the press as doing something that that really harms the public interest or particular communities, then you'll have someone like Tyler Cowen, Hobart professor of economics at George Mason University, which sounds very impressive, um, come out to take the side of the corporations and toe the corporate libertarian line. So it's really a, a form of disinformation of the public, I think. It's, it's an abuse of academic integrity, uh, and it's really made it hard for the public to be able to understand where the truth lies because you have so much self-interested, you know, corporate um, funded and backed and encouraged <clears throat> speech out there. And I happen to know from having been at a kind of Coke conference, a memorial um, event for someone they didn't understand I was there, but I heard all these little Coke faculty members, these, these men, Kind of boasting to each other about how many how much they've done in the media you know and what they've done this year and they're you know back and forth and it's like a competitive enterprise to show that they are shifting the public debate so i think you know this is something going back to what charlie said at the top of the hour that people you know on the progressive side of the spectrum and frankly in the mainstream anywhere that's not in that that you know, right pole of the universe, we have got to start reclaiming the public conversation, um, altering the way that we talk about government and remembering that it's what we do together in order to protect one another and our, you know, our families and our world. And so I know, you know, Lisa, we're all involved in this group, The Bold Rethink, that tries to do that. But I think there's other ways, too, that we can be encouraging um, a kind of game changing uh, reboot of the public conversation away from all of this toxic corporate funded distortion and disinformation. Yeah, you know, Nancy, you make so many great points there. And one of the things that I recall is how much money um, Charles Koch's fortune has has given to Tucker Carlson's daily caller operation. So one of his outlets has received huge funds from the from Coke World, and we've seen, seen so much disinformation, you know, coming from that that quadrant. And it is 
um, not just like corporate money in the sense of whatever Coke Industries gives, but the CEO money, uh, yes. uh, the money that uh, CEOs like corporate, like uh, Charles Coke spend and uh, previously weapons merchants like John Olin spend um, and others. Um, and so I'm gonna kick off the final round, which I know will not involve the famous Star Wars versus Star Trek uh, <laughs> question. Uh, I'm gonna kick it off with uh, what should people do, what can people do, and I'm gonna just say for me, um, uh, people can make some calls, get some calls into your member of Congress, House, Senate, uh, uh, over and over as much as you can um, for um, fairfight.com has a hot summer call campaign and hope folks will call and support HR1 S1. This is my personal view, uh, request to help um, do the reforms that Charlie talked about, that Nancy mentioned that we, um, that, that are really um, uh, important reforms for our democracy. Um, to protect our elections and to protect the right to vote. And there's also the John Lewis Act, but uh, fairfight.com is one place you can go. So uh, I'm gonna go to Charlie and then, we have, then I'm gonna give Nancy the last word. Uh, the same thing, um, immediately speaking, uh, Declaration for American Democracy is the coalition, 200 groups spanning the spectrum of civil society that's working for those bills. I would say go there to get the latest. Um, I also want people to, to encourage people to do like what the populist movement did with the Chautauquas, which is to step back and do some reading on all this stuff um, and think about what did they do? Um, you know, we need to start thinking about, well, how do we take back things that have been claimed by the market or protect public institutions? You know, right before the election, people were outraged that Trump put Louis DeJoy in there. And I know, Lisa, you've done tremendous research on this. Louis DeJoy, a private businessman, appointed the Postal Service basically to destroy it so that Trump could destroy uh, absentee or mail-in voting. Um, people responded, you know, this is like one of the parts of government that people love. It's in every community. There were 530 odd demonstrations at postal offices around the country on one day, organized by moveon.org. So this kind of distributed, uh, you mentioned, you know, they have organized money. We've gone through so many dimensions of that in this discussion. And then there's organized people. And we have the ability now with the internet to do a lot more than what they did during the populist movement, I would say. Um, but we've got to also think long-term. We've got to think structural. We've got to think institutional. We've got to have that blue sky thinking, win these immediate victories so that the doors open for democracy and we can run an agenda through Congress, the most important institution we have to setting policy right now. Um, so let's start with getting the For the People Act passed and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act or whatever it's called. It's being introduced this week, actually. Um, and then we can uh, move forward from there. Nancy. I totally uh, endorse the um, wonderful suggestions that you both uh, just made. And I would say another crucial thing that we need to begin to do in order to enable all that is mobilize at the state level. Um, the place that progressives have lost the most power has been at the state level since, you know, started a bit earlier, but particularly since 2010, so that this corporate controlled transformed death cult that is the Republican Party today, now has control of 30 states in this country. And using those 30 states, that is how it's able to do things like suppress the vote, like do the most ridiculous gerrymanders in the world, like what they've done to my state, North Carolina. And so it tends to be now that the part of government that people focus on least is actually the one that affects a lot of the stuff that, that they deal with on a daily basis. So I think you've got to get people really paying attention to state government and to the 2022 midterms, because we need to have a huge sense of urgency about this. The democracy, you know, if you remember the old um, nuclear clock of the Union of Concerned Scientists that would show, you know, when we were close to nuclear war, I think the democracy clock is about four minutes to midnight right now. Mm -hmm. And I think there are amazing people out there who are doing heroic work, you know, in every state of the country, in, you know, Stacey Abrams and, and you know, the, the um, uh, folks in Georgia, the most obvious, but this is going on everywhere, but everywhere they need reinforcements, right? We need more people to get in the process of registering, of you know, being on the doors, talking to neighbors, encouraging people to reclaim 
government of by and for to make for the first time really but government of by and for the people because what's going to happen in 2022 is going to shape everything thereafter and we do have a problem on the progressive side that there's two electorate the presidential electorate is much more diverse and is kind of our electorate the midterm electorate tends to be older conservative whiter um and if that's what happens in 2022 it's going to be bad. So I think this is a great time to, you know, uh, practice democracy every day, not just in election season, because setting the groundwork now, this fall for 2022, is going to prove all important. So with that, we can also move the wonderful uh, agenda items that you two have, have uh, laid out. Oh, well, Nancy, thank you so much. And thank you, Charlie. Um, I feel like we've made uh, some effort toward fighting uh, what I call the lucrative lie that Fox is getting quite rich on and that some of these groups are raising so much money on to really distort our democracy. So this um, program will be available uh, to be shared. And um, it's a joy for me, an honor for me to have the chance to have this dialogue with the two of you, I adore. Right back and at you. <laughs> so smart. So talented, such great truth tellers. Um, on behalf of uh, my organization, True North Research and Bold Rethink, thank you for joining us. Thank you for marking the Paul Memo anniversary and um, go fight win. We have a lot of work to do to try to uh, uh, expand our democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa and Charlie. Great to talk with you. Thank you. Bye.